What's up, man? Hey, how are you? <laughs> oh, I'm good. Um, double podcast day. Double, well, for us. Yeah, for us. But I mean, yeah, no one knows. We could pretend that it's not double podcast day. It it went well. I I uh, I thought maybe I'd lose steam, but both of our guests um were great. But you know, but, we talk we talk. Um, sorry, I cut you off. No, I was gonna say we're the 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 podcast that we're going to talk about right now is Josh Salinger from Bird's Mouth Design Build out in Portland, Oregon, um, which was a good conversation. There's so much to talk to him about. If you're unfamiliar with him, um, don't know who he is, check him out. He does a, a fair amount of education, a ton of writing. He's very involved with the building community. Um, so he's a really good resource. Yeah, I mean, he's he is very driven by building better homes from for climate but uh he goes on to say you know it's for society um and there's a lot of talk about energy efficiency and building more energy efficiency homes which you know contrary to the conversation we had a couple weeks ago where there was an argument against that josh actually kind of backed up what he was saying is that energy efficiency isn't the focus here it's the byproduct of what is in focus which is a great way to put that and i think actually really helps you understand the 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 importance of building better uh and not just building more energy efficient yeah and the it, it, he discusses how a lot of the issues arise from designing a home and then trying to make it energy efficient rather than designing with that in mind um, from the get go and just creating and having the thought process dialed in that leads to more energy efficient style of home. So uh, I honestly, I want to get him back on. I have a lot still to ask him. We discussed some business um, ideas. So I definitely somebody I want to hop back on on another podcast with. I think you will all enjoy this podcast. Um, so buckle up. And uh, just for for what it's worth, you know, what you just said. A lot of this stems from the disconnect between design and build uh, and, and, and fun fact. And he's going to tell you, but I'm going to spoil it here, is that the original definition of an architect is actually he says master builder, but I looked it up. It's actually chief builder. Uh, which means that in order to be an architect, you had to actually understand um, building first. So we'll get into that. Like Tyler said, let's buckle up. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Also, the T-shirts, Modern Craftsman T-shirts oh, hell yes. are on pre-sale on the website. So www.moderncraftsman.co. Uh, there's a shop tab that you can go on there and pull up your size. Uh, we made them through a pretty small scale local uh, vendor. They're super nice shirts. Um, we, we felt as though going with a smaller company and a higher quality shirt was more in line with what we do, what we are looking to stand for. So it's, it's not your throwaway free t-shirt that you get um you know when you attend an event it's a nice a nice t-shirt that you guys will be happy with so go check them out spread the word share the link buy some shirts there you go i'm not even gonna add to that let's get into it hey tyler are your clients asking for a focus on indoor outdoor living in their homes because anderson has a broad portfolio of products that can help you deliver on this piece of luxury living that everyone is asking for most think about big doors first and they have plenty of those in fact the lift slide door can be as large as 16 feet tall and 60 feet wide, but Anderson also has plenty of options to bring outdoor slash indoor living to a home with a smaller footprint. Not to mention the A-series patio door goes up to 10 foot tall panel and with a four panel configuration, you can reach up to 16 foot wide. For spaces where a door isn't an option, but you still want to open the wall, there are pass-through windows that can fold out or even pocket. New construction or home renovation, explore the solutions at andersonwindows.com. I also have to give a special shout out to Ellie and the team over at Anderson. Ellie claims that she had nothing to do with this, but I ordered windows for a job a month or so ago, and they're ready to be delivered. And I ran into another issue on the job where I had to add two additional windows to the order, and she hooked me up with some local uh, Anderson reps who are able to take my order from my 
vendor and push that through out to Anderson to basically bump the order back uh, a shorter amount of time and get everything to deliver all at once. So thank you to everyone over there who made that happen and is helping maintain some sort of normalcy and schedule for me over there. So and I'm pretty sure that pretty sure i saw your windows being thrown into the mix on their social oh, media yeah. the other day on oh, their yeah. stories so they actually put a poll up if if uh, people want to see more behind the scenes coming from someone that has toured that factory go over to their, their instagram anderson windows and tell them that you want to see more behind the scenes action yeah definitely check it out this podcast is also brought to you by build a trend builders listen up in the world of construction we know one thing for sure numbers don't lie And here are some jaw-dropping stats coming from builders around the entire country. Meet Chris Lede Homes. I'm hoping that that's Lede. It's L-E-D-E-T. We're going with Lede. Chris Lede, if we're wrong. They didn't give us the the phonetic um, way to pronounce that. So I'm going with Lede. But this company saves a whopping 40 hours per week on project setup. Then there's the Bridge Group. uh, Did a much better job of pronouncing that they doubled their sales in just three years and finally there's color houses today they deliver more accurate timelines in half the time but how is all this possible their real world results build a trend has brought to builders just like you why let your business miss out on this level of success say goodbye to tedious project planning chaotic sales and inaccurate estimates it's time to let your business's numbers speak for themselves Give Builder Ten a try. Don't try and steal that from me. I was going to. It's I'm still not in sure the set. No, that's yeah. Seriously, yeah. give Builder Trend a try. It was either that or you were going to sneeze. <laughs> give Builder Trend a try and sign up today at buildertrend.com forward slash mc demo. You guys hear me? Yeah, you sound great. You're 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 outside though. Uh, no, that's a, uh, no, I know it's background. a green screen. I'm just kidding. <laughs> as he fades in this, and out of it. Yeah. As he, I know. As his I have this light disappear. fixture right here. Like, uh, that oh, shows no, yeah, up above yeah. my head every now and then, which is completely confusing. It's like it'll, it'll make me look picture. like I'm descended from heaven. It does look it's like you're descended. aura <laughs> above me. Your headphones keep disappearing. That's amazing. Yeah, What's up, I mean, man? I could, How are you? I'm okay. How are you doing? Just Okay. I okay is okay is good. I feel like okay is good. Everyone always wants to say I'm great. It's like, come on, be honest. You're not great right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm. uh, Let's see. This morning I went. It's hot here in Portland right now. It's like 105. So I went for a walk this morning with a colleague. It was great. And then I went off to a job site to show a potential customer client uh, one of our builds, and they were just beside themselves with how great it was and so then i came back and i had a delicious sandwich and now i'm here so i mean like i'm 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 okay i'm good so that sounds better than okay but i'll yeah. I'll, I'll let you i'll let you have it well you wanted it out of 10 i'm giving i'm giving an eight and a half or nine i mean why not it's great wait it's Do 105 you... there yeah i'm like i thought you were pretty high, far north yeah we get these crazy we had a heat dome here um this is actually something we could talk about if you wanted. Um, yeah. The uh, we had a heat dome two years ago. It got to be 116 in Portland. Jeez. Uh, what is a heat does, dome? How does that happen? It was like a high pressure system just parked over us. I mean, this is all part of climate change, right? And like mm. we never saw things like this before. This is the same heat dome that parked over the Pacific Northwest, and there was a town in Canada that spontaneously ignited and burned the town down. It I don't was think crazy I heard high. about that. <laughs> definitely that happened that. but when, when you said was dome, i'm like what is that movie and i just looked it up the biodome biodome oh yeah, biodome yeah such yeah. a good movie i mean from good my movie, recollection but... it was 1996 it came out but with probably right. sure uh yeah, yeah. i you saw him watch when, it. I was, when i was out in la he was just like sitting at a coffee shop drinking coffee he didn't look too great yeah well, maybe he's still around guy, though yeah. poor guy yeah i think he uh he peaked a while ago yeah, exactly. He was definitely an early peaker. Yeah. I, I'm still going up. I haven't peaked yet. I'm working on That's that. That's what I'm trying to do. Are you well, in I, the city limits of Portland? I am. Mm-hmm. You live in Portland? How long have you lived there? 
Uh, I landed here about 23 years ago. Damn. Yeah. So I, <clears throat> I just got tattooed by a guy who owns a shop, um, Atlas Tattoo. Oh, in this Portland. is from Atlas Tattoo. Oh, nice. Who did it? Oh, gosh. I wouldn't remember his name. Uh, he was one of the, I had this done 15 years ago or something yeah. like that. So um, Dan is the owner. That's who I got tattooed by. Um, but he was, we were talking to him about Portland and how it's changed and how 20 some years ago it was like super rough. Um, and then it, it got fairly gentrified and got a lot better. And now they're having, um, the issues that they're having, um, with the homeless and, what is the the drug um, that they just fentanyl? Threw? Yeah, fentanyl that they're like essentially giving parking tickets out for. Um, yeah. And he's like, he's like, yeah. you have all these people who moved in when it got really nice, and now there's like the the issue with the fentanyl. And he's like, it's still so much nicer than when I moved in here like 25 years ago. So it's all relative. He's like, it it's still nice. That's a that's a actually I a nice way to put it because oftentimes you hear about this the fentanyl and the homeless and people are like oh portland you know it's like it's actually really nice around here it's like i took a walk out on this like park that's like five blocks from my house around the reservoir is beautiful um i can walk down to a bakery a brewery uh restaurants like i mean we got everything we need my kids walk around ride their bikes everywhere the high school is really nice right over here. i mean it's it's great, but you hear about all the fentanyl and the homelessness and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, he, so. he he's like basically the New York Times is writing all these articles saying how shitty Portland is when like they're responsible for advocating for Portland before that made it so nice. So now it's like the same people who wanted people to come in or like move to Portland are now basically bashing Portland. Um, but I was out in Portland probably. That's how I met Dan and wanted to get tattooed by him, but it was 12 years ago. We spent some time out that way, um, and I didn't have a chance to get tattooed by him, but I just got tattooed by him two weeks ago. But Portland was nice. Um, interesting city, like from an East Coast city mentality where everything, like the square mileage of the cities tends to be small and everything's super condensed. Like Portland's very spread out. You mm. like there's pockets of neighborhoods and it's probably yep. less so now, 15 years later, but it was, it was interesting where like you would be in a pocket that was super built up and populated. And then we're like, Oh, we're going to go check out this on the other side of town. And it would be like, fairly desolate in between those two spots and then it would be a city again yeah no that's actually one of the really great things about it is all those little neighborhoods and it's still that way um because i lived before this i was in the bay area then i was in denver uh originally from wisconsin um but you know all these cities have like their big downtowns and that's kind of like where everyone goes is the downtown kind of core mm. but portland's different in that it's got like all these separate unique little neighborhoods all over the place we can be like let's head to alberta or let's go to vancouver or let's go to hawthorne or let's go to division or whatever it is and they're all different and in between it there's just kind of like residential yeah yeah it was so much it different than like unique. any city even like West Coast cities, the bigger cities, they're just not built like that. So it was a pretty unique experience for us. Um, but it uh, this, that was, again, 12 years ago. So I feel the city has grown a lot since then. Yeah, it's changed. I and mean, we've got a lot more tech bros and, you know, more money. It's turning more into like Seattle or something like that. But we still got the neighborhoods and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I mean speaking of unique, your, your office is in an old rail car. Yeah. Yeah, that that's amazing. I, yeah. I, I was on your website and it, it like you, you explain your address and how you can't find it. So I, I was like, all right, I gotta I gotta see this on Google. And I pulled it. I'm looking at it on the map right now, and I I, I have no idea. If, I don't have any question other than the fact that it's it's super cool. Yeah, it, yeah. So I, I joke that I'm like a Portland um, joke. Like I literally, our company name has a bird on it. Um, we build zero energy homes and we work out of a, uh, rail car. So <laughs> some yeah, sort I'm of like money a, laundering business. I'm a Portlandia <laughs> joke. Basically. <laughs> I'm like, I had the bird on it before the Portlandia thing. We've been in that rail car for a long time now. So, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a converted 1949, uh, Pullman rail car and we've got our offices in there and that's, um, how did that come about? Our... Like did, 
those those have just been sitting there and someone decided to buy and then rent them? It's a longer story, but um, in a nutshell, we were looking for an office and woodshop because the one I was in was just too small and couldn't find anything affordable with a wood shop. So my wife was like, why not just get an office and mm -hmm. find a separate wood shop? And I was like, sure. And she went looking one day and she sent me this text. She's like, what about this? And it's got this picture of a rail car. And I'm like, ha ha, that's funny. And she's like, no, it's actually really cool. And um, what it was, uh, was this old rail guy who used to own a section of rail uh, mm -hmm. from the town south of Portland that used to take blue collar workers up into Portland. And he's been selling off chunks of this rail to like a nature preserve or like, a, you know, all these different industries and stuff. But he kept this hmm. little portion of rail. And for some reason or another, there was four rail cars parked there. I've never been able to really figure out how that came to be. But one of the owners of the rail cars had decked it out into this gorgeous like um, Airbnb bedroom, like kind of awesome thing. And she couldn't find anyone to live in it. So she was trying to rent it to businesses. And that's when I found it. And within a couple of months, she's like, do you want to buy this thing? And it was cheaper for me to buy it. The payments on the loan were cheaper than the rent. Um, so I bought it. It's literally right downtown Portland. Like I can. Yeah, I'm looking at I, it. Yeah. If I chuck a tennis ball and then walk over and chuck it again, it'll be in the river. It's like it's right downtown. So you own um, the property that it's on as well as the rail and the rail car? So the property that's on, we pay a nominal rental fee for just being on the tracks there. Yeah. To the guy, to, Dick Samuels, like the rail. To the guy that owns these chunks of rail. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we've got electrical service there. So it's got everything we need there. I put in some mini splits. So we got heating and cooling. Uh, put in a full-on bathroom. Uh, I just have a blackwater tank in the rail mm -hmm. underneath. And, uh, you know, the local you know, sanitation company comes and just pumps it out. Um, and then we have rainwater catchment. We put some gutters on and it rains enough throughout the winter with two like 800 gallon cisterns on the backside of the rail cars that fill up and they'll last till right about now, this time of year uh, with the rain. And, uh, and that's what flushes the toilet. Um, and then we just like once or twice a year, we have like a water truck come and fill them up and it works. Um, the location is brilliant. It's cheap. It's unique, which kind of yeah. fits us anyways, because we do weird shit. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. So what well, do you guys pay to the city or does he nothing. pay? So he pays just, the rails are like a, uh, it's like another country within the country. It's like, there's like no jurisdiction that governs it. Really? Like every time we, we just put in an electric car charger and I was like, do we need to get permits? And I like barked it all the way up through the city. And they're like, we have no jurisdiction over that. That's the rail. And that's, you can, that's insane. You can do anything. And so it's like, well, we'll do it to code. You know, we don't want to burn down or anything. But so we technically you could build like a high rise on top of that rail. <laughs> well, I don't know that you could do that, but well, why not? Um, <laughs> you just build this like eight and a half foot wide, hundred foot tall tower. Right, right. I wonder how you um, how you come to acquire a section of rail. So his family had owned it. It was Samuel, this guy, Dick Samuels, Samuels Rail Lines. He had owned this. Someone owns a section of rail at some point in time. You know, he sold off a bunch of it to the BNSF or whatever the large rail companies are. And that's where like the large freight goes through. Um, that's just a few tracks up from us. Um, but yeah, he he owns this. Yeah, Chunk. you would think that like the the state or the city owned it and then the rail people leased it from them. That's interesting. No, it's, Who knew? it's really like a separate government inside of government. I mean, it's it's why they could put creosote and terrible shit and spray pesticides yeah, along true. rail lines because they can just get away with anything because there's no jurisdiction around yeah, it's crazy. that. Um, it's Who a longer knew? story. They actually, he sold that and they're going to be moving the trains and literally building a high rise where we are right now. Um, they're going to be relocating us and hooking us up to the city power and giving us like a, it's, it's going to be awesome in the future, but um, they literally are going to be putting a high rise there because it's prime real estate. It's right That's funny. downtown on the east side of the river. So he's selling that or is he developing that? He sold it to the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, which is right across the street. Um, yep. So right across the street, it's like all the kids get dropped off at the summer camps. There's a planetarium. There's an Om Omnimax theater. 
Um, you know, they have like dinosaurs. It's a the museum of science and industry. So maybe there. you don't know yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. This is completely <laughs> off topic. But once he sells that, do they get that zone transfer, whatever it is, to the city that at that point it's like a taxable plot of land? Yeah, yeah. it'll be under the city's jurisdiction then. Absolutely. Damn. I couldn't, I couldn't talk to you about how specifically yeah. that happened, but yes, it's very much part of the city's jurisdiction. Hmm. Damn. Once they build those buildings, once yeah. you let it go, you're never getting it back. Yeah. It's like the last like, piece of the wild, wild west this podcast. Not, not my train. I just had no office. idea that that's how that worked. <laughs> yeah, um, it's super interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna get, like it. Damn, that's sick. It's all the, the city's on a grid, huh? I wonder if you can mm-hmm. get like arrested on the railroad tracks. Then, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we get we get people wandering through there, and like, sure. But if there's no like, jurisdiction, that's what I'm. I mean, trying you can to literally out. do fentanyl without getting arrested on the tracks that's, there because it's yeah. legal. And but I mean, you can do that any, like, hey, you can do that anywhere in Portland. Hey, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with the railroad tracks. Right. I mean, if you shot someone in the rail, like, yes, the police will. It's not like they stop at the border and they can't yeah. cross. It probably just like push that. you off the rail and then be like, all right, now you're now now I can lock you up. Right. <laughs> Do you ever put pennies on the railroad track when you were little and have the rail cars run over them? No. Well, we always heard about that and we always put them there, but then we had to go home or something and we never yeah. went back. So I don't know. <laughs> There's like an old freight train behind where I grew up um, that would come by maybe uh, once a day, but you would hear it coming and it was so slow. And I like, I lived two lots in front of it. So we'd be able to run back in time and catch it. It was also next to like a convenience store in town that we spent too much time at. So we definitely. Definitely did. My, my, I told my kids about that. They're like, "You did what?" It's like, "Yeah, it's pretty cool." That was like the stuff. So did we you did actually do the day. penny thing? Like, yeah, I was yeah, yeah. About that, but, yeah, yeah. Just smashes them. Yeah, it it's doesn't cool. like make them into a flat oval or something. I mean, like yeah, it's pretty flat. Um, yeah. it, I feel like it was cool. That that like stupid stuff we were doing when we were little. Yeah. We also used to like have fights with the kids on the other side of the railroad tracks or be like war where you'd stay on your side of railroad tracks and throw stuff back and forth. Are you (laughs) sure this isn't a musical? (laughs) You could do it. You could could do it with your railroad. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. I'm going to stake out my territory and start Um, dancing. Yeah. So I, I was reading um, on the Fine Home Building website that you graduated from college with a double major in zoology and conservation. Yeah. What was the plan? Um, by the way, are we live? Is this happening now? Oh, yeah. It's, oh, we've been live for happening. 16 minutes. Oh, this is great. All right, cool. Yeah. yeah we just, we, there's I didn't know no, if this was the preamble banter. No, we, 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 okay. we roll right into it. <laughs> great. <laughs> All right, sorry, Tyler. What was that? The uh, you graduated from college with a double major in zoology and conservation. Like, what was what was the plan? What was the career move, or was it just to get through college? Um, I think. I, well, I know that I I did that because I always had this ethos. I'm not sure where it came from around sustainability ever since I was a kid. Like my my parents could care less. You know, I mean they they would laugh when they put the recycling in the garbage. They thought it was hilarious. You know, um, but. I always had that in me. And so when I went off to school, I realized that, oh, I can get a degree in conservation and I can spend my time out in the woods, um, you know, collecting insects and going hiking and whatever else. And it was just awesome to get outside and um, be a part of that. So um, that's why I followed that pursuit. And I really enjoyed kind of the philosophical bend on it, you know, like talking about ecology and talking about um, sustainability and conservation, you know, uh, global warming, all that kind of stuff was all part of it. Um, so I just really was attracted to that and, and, and did that. Um, and then I got out of college and realized like, oh man, there's no work to be had yeah. uh, in this field. Right. I mean, I could get a job in the wilds of Montana for a summer, uh, and get paid next to nothing. And there'd be a hundred people fighting for that position. You know, it was just, there wasn't any there like perpetual internships yeah that's kind of what it was like yeah so were Um, you were you in wisconsin until you went to school uh yeah i grew up in wisconsin yep graduated from university of wisconsin madison and then after that i ended up kind of taking off all over the place to eventually land here in portland oregon So so what what was the like job um 
path that led you to where you are today after college? So um, I ended up traveling around uh, Europe, the Middle East, uh, moved back to the Bay Area or Colorado, lived there for a while, moved to uh, the Bay Area and eventually moved into Portland with a bunch of um, friends, guys who I just kind of met along the way and whatever, and um, bought a house here in Southeast Portland or it was renting a house. And a number of these guys were um, carpenters. And as a kid, uh, my dad used to kind of blow off steam by doing carpentry work. He was an executive vice president and general counsel for a chain of banks uh, in the Midwest. And so he had this like really stressful white collar job. And on the weekends in the summers to blow off steam, he would build a deck or he would remodel the basement or we'd redo the siding, we'd do the screen porch or something like that. And as a kid, um, it was always really fun to be hanging out with dad and playing with the, I remember when he got his first sliding compound miter saw, like it was probably 35, 40 years ago. It was like the first one ever. Uh, and it was just fascinating to me, you know? Um, and so anyways, I, I always enjoyed carpentry and doing that just because my dad was having such a great time with it. It was just a fun thing to do. And so I moved in with these guys in this rental house and they were, um, carpenters and they had all the tools and all the stuff. And I was like, Oh my God, I used to love these, the stuff carpentry. Right. And so at the time I was bartending, uh, at a restaurant downtown and I would start building things with these guys. And I would talk about it at night while I was bartending. And eventually I'd get someone being like, Hey, would you build a deck over at my place or something like that? Small stuff like a fence or a deck or little repairs. I'd be like, sure. And so I started picking those things up and uh, then it kind of grew and grew until I got an offer to do a rather large project. It was a, a fourplex, uh, kind of like a light commercial thing. And I said, yes. Um, and I dove into it, started a company, uh, dove into it and proceeded to completely fail <laughs> from a financial perspective because I, I had no idea about the business of it. I was a good carpenter but I really didn't understand the business end of things. And so um, I, I think I lost about 40, 50 K on that project. And I remember Damn. having to take like a lock on my house just to like get through it. Um, but to this day, I never told the clients that. Um, and they're still very happy with the work. The work turned out great. Well, of and course still- you did it for 40 to 50 grand less than everyone else would have done it for. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I would love it too. Well, I know they were stoked. I mean, they, they got a great they deal. started the job <laughs> off with 50 grand of equity. Yep. And, uh, I, I mean, I see that in the younger generation coming up, I see myself in them just like honestly trying to do good, but just not really being ready or understanding, you know, all of the aspects of what's involved in running what, a business. And, what were some of the mistakes that you made in that? Like, I understand you're, you're, you're kind of generalizing that you didn't understand the business of it, but specifically what were some of the things that you overlooked pretty pretty naive stuff i mean i I would have been embarrassed to admit it back then but like i didn't understand how we had to report all the workers comp stuff Mm -hmm. right so i ended up like not really reporting it correctly and eventually i get this bill from the workers comp insurance for a huge sum of money right Mm -hmm. um i didn't understand um how to correctly um, bid the project, you know? So it's like, I, there were things that showed up that were outside of what I thought was on there. And I didn't have the wherewithal to know how to properly do change orders or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, capture it in the first place. So I ended up kind of mopping that up, right. Um, inefficiencies, uh, you know, hiring people and, um, not really paying all the general liability insurance that was required to hire. You know, so it was like, I was playing in the semi-legal, uh, area and it was total naivete it wasn't like i was trying to like you know make you weren't it out trying to, right, you weren't trying to pull establishment or something you know it was it was just total i didn't know and all those cows came home and it was very expensive when they all came home mm-hmm. right and, and i look back at that uh, that was my education um into the trades because after that you know i was expecting my first kid Um, and I was like, oh man, like if I'm going to make a go of this, I really got to pay attention. And that's when I really started hitting the books, you know, in terms of the business end of things and, uh, really asking questions of those that were successful, Mm -hmm. um, going to 
meetups, you know, going to different forums, things like that, and just marinating in the business of running a construction company. At the time, we was just we were GCs. Uh, right now, we're design built, so we have architects and we do architecture and design too. But back then, it was just construction, and um, you know, just marinated in that for years until I fully understood things um, yeah. and was able to kind of get my feet back underneath me and make a go of it. Do you think those lessons would be avoidable in, in any capacity starting your own business the way you did? You know, I mean, if I had talked to, like I mentioned, all those forums, all those people that were successful, if I had just spent the time and, you know, had conversations with them or learned this stuff ahead of time, I would have realized what was involved and in, in the right way to, you know, set up a contract, for instance, or, or you know, any of these things. And so oftentimes That's... when I'm talking to younger generations, it's like, talk to older people, talk to people who have done mm -hmm. this before. There are, people have written about this, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. I, the, the, the one thing there though, is you, it's not that you didn't ask because you didn't want to, it's because you didn't know, you didn't yeah. know what to ask. And yeah. insurance is a great example where it's like, you know, we just had a, a trade come to us mad at us because we had asked them, Hey, does your, the, like, do your insurance requirements meet our, our requirements? Like, I'm sorry, do, does your insurance coverage meet our requirements? And mm -hmm. he had asked the question to uh, his agent and his agent then, you know, asked what the scope of the work was. And we, he went back and said, this is the scope of the work. And they were like, you're not insured for that scope. And he ended up getting a $40,000 premium adjustment and was pissed off at us. And I was right. like, with, with all due respect, all we did was ask if you were going to meet our requirement and what shook out between you and your, your insurance company, that's between you guys. And, mm. and, and I remember, but I, but I remember early on, it's like taxes too. It's like, you get to the end of the year, they audit your workers comp, you pay all this fee, like you're mad at them. You're mad at the situation. It's like, the, this is a scam. Insurance is a scam. Like, it's like, no, you just aren't, you, you, sh you should have been educated as to what this actually costs to run a business. And you said something a second ago, that's important to, you know, where you were, I think you said running barely legal. And that's, that is so often something that like is taken advantage of in this industry. I feel like, like you know, that's not a term that we should be using on the podcast. Barely legal. <laughs> yeah. You might get more. more I, don't th I don't think uh, anything good is uh, going to be coming from that. Well, now if that's it's a not word. Thank you. Um, <laughs> somewhat legal. <laughs> somewhat legal. <laughs> almost. Um, almost. No, I'm not using it. I'm not sure if this is helping. Listen, no, none of you guys are helping right now. But the, the reality is, is like our industry is flooded with people that there's a lot like, like ourselves at one point, we didn't know that we needed that particular mm -hmm. insurance. So I get to be the cheap guy and I get the work. And then, yep. you know, like you did on this multi and then all of a sudden it's like at the end of the year you get screwed and you pay all these, this cost in insurance. It's like, and then you write that off as like cost of doing business, but it's not cost of doing business. It's the cost of the, to, to the, of the work. It's a cost of good. Yeah. It, and, it makes you understand libertarianism. You know, you just are like anti-government trust or something. Yeah. Like that. You need to be mad at somebody, right? But you're it's not like, able to. Oh do wait, I, I actually just didn't know that this is what's required to run a a, a, a legal business. Well, it's and just it's in your up. best interest to be insured correctly because if right. something goes wrong, then I mean, it's it's in your so to get and it's just and it's pointing foolish. anger at the wrong place. Yeah, yeah, and it's foolish too when you're talking to a client where it's like, you know we had one client was like, why are you charging for insurance? I was like, because we are required to have insurance on this job. And, and they were like, well, none of my, none of the other contractors I ever worked with charge for insurance. I'm like, well, two things. I don't know if they're properly insured or if they're burying that cost elsewhere. But what I can tell mm -hmm. you is that 1.1% of the cost of this job is going to go to the insurance company because I'm doing this job, not because I'm in business, not because I have people on payroll, because I'm doing this job. Yeah. And it, I think and part of the problem with residential construction, unlike commercial, is that there isn't standard operating procedures that are consistent throughout the industry. And so anyone could come up with 
any perfectly good ways to slice and dice the way that they, for instance, put their insurance uh, overhead into their billing or into their whatever it is, right? And so someone like you might say, hey, this is, I'm being very, you know, open and this is just part of our cost of business and you're going to pay it here. Or someone else might be like, well, I'm not going to bother them with that information. I'm just going to capture that in our overhead so I don't show it. Mm -hmm. Both of those ways are perfectly fine. I mean, it's like choose which one works for you. But the difference is, is that from the client's perspective, they don't know the difference. They, they think that someone might be charging them something different than the other person. And because it's just kind of a wild west free for all in residential uh, construction, um, there are no ways for a client to be able to compare apples to apples on these types of things, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll tell a story about um, a local guy, really nice guy. I grab beers with him. I like him. He does some really nice building. Um, but I know that he just, um, he'll work with other independent contractors, carpenters that have their own licenses, right? Lone wolves, as we call them around here. Mm -hmm. And he'll bring them on uh, to do a bunch of the labor on his projects, but they're not his employees. Um, so he's avoiding the cost of all the burdened labor from the employment perspective and the workers' comp perspective. And this is not legal, at least in the state of Oregon, um, because you can't direct what uh, your subs are doing from day right. to day or whatever. And that's what he's doing, right? Um, and he is able to undercut our pricing because he's not paying for all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? Now, he's a nice guy. Um, I don't know if he knows this specifically or not. My hunch is that he does know it and he's probably just able to lower his fees for it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it artificially deflates the true value in the market of what it takes to do construction properly. That's right. a great, that's a great, that's a great way to put that where I think that that's the issue with our industry. That's one of the biggest issues with our industry is that pricing is being artificially deflated where homes are getting bigger and more complex and, and price is continuing to be driven down and usually through avenues by using trades that aren't legal, barely I mean, legal. What, 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 what barely word are, legal. that are barely <laughs> legal. Uh, but but trades that aren't operating They're in between legal and illegal. <laughs> there you go. That's not that sounds worse. I don't know. <laughs> but they're, they're just not they're not a business. They're they're someone that's performing work and and trying to, you know, skate under the radar. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, too, know builders that, you know, basically thought they found a loophole. And they were like, hey, I've reduced my insurance costs significantly because I'm doing it this way or I'm having, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm funding all of my trades through a separate business rather than running it through the G it's like you're doing all of this so you can be cheaper when the re uh, be because you, you want to sell the client on a bigger house for a lesser cost when that's mm -hmm. not the value of that house. And what should, yeah. If they're and, doing and we, that right, like it really shouldn't even be that much cheaper if like their sub is carrying the proper insurance and the workers comp to be a sub under you. Like No, but the problem is is they don't carry the proper insurance. We we I'll well, give you an example. I'll give you an example. We are looking at a project right now and in order to work in that particular building, they require a 10 million dollar umbrella, which is insane. Like insane. And I've never had anyone over five million. They're like no exceptions. Call my insurance company. Hey, what's the cost to add this? We, it's only for one job. They're like, we can't add it for one job. You have to add it for the year. Okay, no problem. How much is it? Twenty five thousand dollars. So that's an example. Like you know, now not someone can't come in there and be like, hey, I don't have it, and they get to work in the building. The building wouldn't allow it. But the reality is, is like when you look at big picture, if that was a requirement to be in business as a GC. And someone has, has a million dollar policy or $5 million policy. Now this person can be $25,000 cheaper because they're not actually carrying the proper insurance. Well, it sounds like in that jurisdiction, they're equalizing the thing, right? By requiring it, in people the, in that, that building. Right? Yes. But that's not always the case throughout our that's, industry. That's what I mean is as an industry and as a whole, or even in the city itself, like there's not these require the, the minimum requirements aren't being vetted like a building is a building's like mm -hmm. no way you're not stepping in front of that in, into that door until i see that you have the proper insurance where it's like 
there's too many people working in the city. I don't have time to make sure everyone's properly insured. So, you know, we'll catch the ones that we catch and we won't catch the ones that we don't. Yeah. And that's, and that's reminds where the, me, the deflation comes in. Reminds me of a um, Tessa Bradley, uh, who is an architect up in Olympia that I, she does some really great work with the uh, artisans group as her company, but she, she has this great saying, she's just like, either you pay for it or you pay for it. Right. So, what she's saying is like either you pay for that ten million dollar policy or coverage or whatever it is, or you don't and you get caught and you, then you really pay for it, right? Right. Uh, as a client, either you pay more for the contractor that is fully licensed and doing everything right, or you pay for it in poor quality of work or um, you know uh, potential issues that arise from insurance or whatever, right? Um, there is no free lunch uh, when it comes to it, and sometimes you can sneak away with it, right? So a client could hire that contractor and they could do good work and they could compl be completely uh, uninsured or, or, or somewhere between legal and not legal um, <laughs> and in, in pull off a perfectly successful project. Right. But that goes back to the whole thing about deflating the true cost of um, what it takes to do construction. Yeah. In our industry. Which is, yeah. is the biggest, the bigger issue for the industry as a whole is that we continue mm -hmm. to drive the price down and build these more elaborate homes. And then it's like when someone comes in with all the proper requirements and managing the project appropriately, it's how, why are you 25% more expensive? It's like, because I'm doing it the, the right way. We're not, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not trying to, you know, fly by fly under the radar. Yeah. And you know, to the, to my story earlier, like, I think some of these people are honestly unaware, right? Um, totally. I, I'm not I, saying I think that that's right. right, you know, but I think that's a part of it. I don't want to just point at people and be like, you're, you're evil. You're doing this wrong on purpose. No, I think you're absolutely um, right. I think, I think a lot of people just, I think you're, I think that they just don't know. And yeah. you know what you said earlier, it's, you know, you didn't know the question to ask. You thought that you were doing it right. It's like, yep, time, material, you know, my business expenses, here we go. It's like, yeah, but did you know that yep. you needed this pol this insurance policy? Did you know that you're going to get audited for every hour someone works? And it's like, no, I didn't know that. I and, and didn't know that. Yeah. So, Josh, exactly. what, um, what are you guys, if for people who don't know, the type of work that you do, obviously you're in Portland, Oregon. Um, I think you have a staff of like 13, 14 people. What are you guys specializing in? Yeah, we do um, design build and we do single family, custom residential and zero energy buildings uh, is what we, we focus on. So um, our last four or five homes have all been uh, FIAS certified builds. Um, so we do focus on, uh, you know, the enclosure first, um, and trying to basically five things we really focus on, um, you know, durability, making sure that these buildings last a really long time, uh, making sure that they're healthy for the people that live in them, uh, making sure they're resilient, right? We want to make sure through that heat dome, like we were talking about before that it does never, it never gets above 87 degrees, even if the power goes out inside this house, so that it becomes survivable or like you think about the. Uh, the Texas cold snap where they were out of power for like yeah. two weeks in the cold and people died. These homes through the better enclosures will never really get below 58, 60 degrees or something like that. So they become survivable. Right. Uh, we also focus on comfort because um, our clients want to have homes that are comfortable and pleasant. Right. They don't want to feel their heat being sucked off of the window over here. Uh, radiant heat coming off the walls and hot days and, good indoor air quality, all that kind of stuff. And uh, when you do all that and you work with best practices throughout every aspect of construction, it turns out that you also get very low energy usage, right? So our company, you know, our mission, we're a mission driven company and we're, our mission is to address climate change through the built environment. That's why I was put on this planet. That's what we do. It's why everyone in my company likes working for our company because it has that meaning, but we emphasize those four things before energy efficiency, because the energy efficiency is just kind of uh, an after effect of doing those things that everybody wants, right? Any professional wants to install the insulation as best as possible. Any professional wants to, uh, you know, install the windows correctly and flash them right. Any professional should be using rain screen if they actually care about building buildings that last a long time. 
any professional should be paying attention to the air barrier if they want to keep nasty stuff out and good stuff in, if they want to keep moisture from getting into their walls, right? This is just craftsmanship applied to best practices throughout all the stages of construction. And that's kind of what we do. Um, so um, long way of saying it, but custom residential zero energy and, um, you know, FIAS projects is what we do. And you, you guys um, have carpenters on staff. So you have a design team on staff and then you have carpenters on staff that can handle some of the work. And then you have office personnel on staff, on staff, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So we've got two uh, designers, architects as part of the design team. Um, then we've got uh, a retrofit division that we started about maybe a year or so ago, um, dealing with the existing built environment. So there's that part of the company. We've got our office manager that does all the office work, HR, stuff like that. Um, then we've got a uh, project manager slash director of operations that kind of does all of the um, uh, you know, takeoffs, uh, contract work, um, change orders, all the office end of the job kind of stuff, project management. Uh, and then we have site managers that are on site that are actually building the buildings, the Bob, the builder types. Um, and then we've got carpenters, um, below them. So we have the full suite of architects, um, office retrofit division and carpenters all under the same umbrella. Are you guys doing any design or consulting for other builders or just for you guys in house? We don't do any design for other builders, um, nor do we work for other architects. Um, and this goes back to um, mm. efficiency, uh, you know, all those five things I talked about. If you really want to make things durable, comfortable, resilient, uh, energy efficient, you really have to do that in design. And if we were to do design for someone else, it's not going to be cost effective. And if we were to build someone else's design, that's not going to be cost effective. You know, so we kept banging our heads against the wall when we keep getting these plans from these architects uh, for this beautiful thing. And we'd have the clients telling us, well, we hired you because we wanted to make it energy efficient and do the right thing, uh, indoor air quality, whatever it was that they were asking for. And we'd go back to the architect and say, well, you realize your plan just really doesn't work for uh, meeting the client's goals. And then the architect would get annoyed with us because we're trying to redesign their wall assemblies or trying to simplify something or get rid of all these huge windows on the south side, uh, whatever it is, you know. And it was just wasn't working. We found ourselves educating architects, educating architects and just getting frustrated. And finally, we're like, you know what? We need to do the design ourselves. And that's when we brought the architects on board ourselves. And then we can, from the inception of the design, working with the client and their goals, design something that will be, you know, all those five attributes that we're looking for, but do it cost effectively. Because yes, you can take a third party design and make it zero energy or really high indoor air quality or durable, whatever it is you're asking for, if you throw enough money at it. Mm. But that's a ridiculous way to go about it. Like we should be delivering these things cost effectively. And I have found the only way to truly do that is to have that integrated design process in the same company to be able to deliver passive house level buildings cost effectively. And so that's eventually, it was like eight years ago is now we brought the design in house. So when you... When you say cost effectively, do you have any idea as to like what percentage you guys are able to save on a build versus the the systems that you used to be using? And I asked because we we had uh, somebody on the podcast recently that we spoke about how much money, time and resources people are spending to create energy efficient homes where it's like you're just exchanging resources for other types of resources where it's like so yeah maybe you're saving energy in the long run but you just wasted how much natural resources trying to get there and like it's yep. it's half you know half dozen six to six of whatever the heck the saying is um where yeah, it's like I, I saw that podcast and i actually well i almost wanted i wanted to bring that up because it was like i get the frustration with the energy efficiency everyone's focusing on energy efficiency energy efficiency right and it's like 
no, 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 no. Let's focus on durability, health, comfort, and resiliency, and the energy efficiency comes from that. Mm -hmm. And if we do this from the very beginning, the other thing we do with our plans is we do a carbon accounting. So we use the BEAM uh, carbon calculator uh, through Builders, at Cl uh, Builders for Climate Action. And so you can actually enter in all the materials into this calculator and it'll give you CO2 equivalents of the carbon, embodied carbon or upfront carbon that's used in those things. And we'll use that information to, at the very early design stages to decide what types of materials we're going to use so that we don't fall into that trap of just buying expensive stuff to make up the difference to save energy. That's a totally wrong approach here. Yeah. Like, you know, yes, it is important to make things energy efficient. Our mission is to address climate change through the built environment, but that's the last thing I'm going to talk about, right? If you do things right, if you don't use fiberglass bats and you instead use blown in, then you're not going to get convection loops in your walls, right? That's better. If you, uh, you know, over insulate your windows, so you don't get those thermal bridges through there with your install, well, then you're going to get more comfort. You're going to get more resiliency, right? That's just better. I could go on and on. If you design your plumbing system so that you don't have a circuitous route to get to it and you have to wait for a long time to get hot water, but instead you design it early on so that you have less than a half a gallon of water between the source and the fixture, people get water really quickly. That's better. Turns out all of those things also save energy. So why, why get hung up on the energy thing? It just frustrates people. Like, let's just do better in all the things that we're doing in buildings. I mean, I, I would assume that it, it's coming from design, not taking that into consideration from the get go. Yeah. In residential, mm -hmm. right? Where like you, most people who are designing these homes are hiring an architect who does not have the knowledge and the know how to be designing an energy efficient home. And then they're saying, okay, now let's essentially make this an energy efficient home where you're saying, no, that, that has to be integrated into the design. It's, you can't take any home design and then make it passive. Like that has to be a consideration from the get-go. Not cost effectively. Yeah. yeah. Right. Can I just um, go back to something you said a minute ago? Because I, I thought it was no. interesting. I've, We're okay. already past that. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're on the wrong side of the tracks, Nick. You, we, <laughs> yeah. I'm with the rocks. So. Um, you said, I, I'm, I'm curious at... I can't be the only one. The, the fiberglass insulation comment about the convection loop. What is that? Oh, I breezed right through that. So, well, uh, I just feel like everyone was like, what the hell is he talking about? So I, I got to ask. Yeah. So if you are installing fiberglass bats, uh, the correct way to do it is to have a class one install, which means that you don't have any compression of the bats. Yes. It means that you don't have any wires that are, uh, you know, causing it to be uh, pushed back. You're not mm -hmm. cutting it around boxes and leaving big holes and stuff like that, because what it does is if you compress it or if you leave big gaps, it allows for as warm air rises, it'll move up the wall cavity and then it'll cool off and go back down and creates this convection loop. And insulation mm -hmm. works because it traps air, right? So if we install a bat incorrectly and we're creating convection loops through the rise and fall of warm air currents, then we're reducing the efficacy of that insulation, right? Because like I said, it's like if you're wearing a sweater on a cold day, you're warm, but if it's windy, that sweater is no good, right? Right. So if we insulate the entirety of the cavity and we don't have those compressions or voids, then there's nowhere for air to create convection loops and then the insulation does its job. Mm -hmm. This isn't a wacko passive house thing or a weird energy saving thing. It's just simply best practices based in physics. Mm -hmm. That's all, Got it. right? So. Yeah, I just use that as one example of the myriad of things that we do in a building. And we want to make sure that we're paying attention to those things to make it right. Um, Tyler, you asked about like, what's the premium uh, for the, you know, doing these things early versus later. And it probably is very project specific, but mm -hmm. I can give a story about that, that I think might illustrate that. Sure. So we're, we're building a house right now that was, it's kind of the exception that proves the rule where um, it was architect designed by a third party architect, a good friend of mine and nice project. Um, and I decided to take this project on. The architect is a friend of yours or the person building the home? The architect is a friend okay. and a great architect. 
And they, they drew this really great, beautiful thing, but it has these large lift slide glass doors facing north. And the building is, is a one story building. So it's like a pancake. So it's got a lot of surface area to volume, you know, as opposed to like more of a cube. Yeah. If you spread it out, you have more surface area to volume. So you have more losses, right? And the client wanted to get it Passive House certified. And in order for us to get that thing Passive House certified, we had to use nine and a half inch TJIs filled full of uh, cellulose plus a two by six wall filled with rock wool. Right. Mm -hmm. So really expensive, really thick wall to meet the PS, the FIAS passive house standard. And on a, another project that we're doing concurrently, um, we were able to meet the same standard with just a two by six wall and that's it. Now we added exterior insulation because we wanted to have durability and some fire resistance and stuff like that. But through design, we were able to shrink that wall down almost by half, half the material, half the thickness, half the labor right? Just through energy modeling and design, right? Because it's more of a, a, a block or a cube, right? Now we dressed it up so it doesn't look like that. Yeah. Um, Cause you don't want to make just ugly boxes, right? And this thing has plenty of windows, right? It looks out over a beautiful river and all this stuff, right? But it just goes to show how much effort and money we spent trying to reach the same standard when it wasn't considered through design. And that's why I said, it's like the perfect example of like the exception that proves the rule. We decided to work for a third party architect and make an exception, but it proved that we can save a lot of money by integrating that design early on to reach those high levels of, you know, comfort, durability, resilience. So what do you feel are the biggest limitations as far as aesthetics go to be designing the houses that you want to be building to be energy efficient? I actually think it's a benefit. Um, so, and hear me out on this one. So if you give me a blank piece of paper and you say, Josh, get creative and draw me something, I'll come up with something, right? But if you give me a piece of paper and you say, well, you can't use the color green and you can't draw over here, but I need it to be this shape, then I'm going to get really creative. And I think that's what brings up the really good ideas and the really clever solutions. So it's um, saying constraint breeds creativity. Absolutely. And so the, the constraints in this case are actually benefits, right? Because if right. you, um, if you design, if you don't over glaze, then you don't get glare or if you under glaze, it's dark, but if mm -hmm. you get it just right, the experience in the house is actually much better for the client. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the constraint, which is a mm -hmm. good thing. And then we're getting creative around that. And, you know, I've seen lots of modern homes that have like soaring concrete with floor to ceiling glass that, you know, cantilever over a whatever gorgeous Vista. But how many of those have you seen? And then when you see a really gorgeous, well done, you know, uh, high performance building, those are the ones that really look good. Um, so I actually think that those constraints make things look much better from aesthetic perspective. Now, the early passive house movement, and this is still stuck in, in people's brains, was, you know, kind of these brutalism, kind of like cubes with hardly any windows and super mm -hmm. thick walls and just kind of ugly, right? It's just not the case anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. the house that I was just describing a couple of minutes ago with the, the better form has huge windows from that overlooks the, the there's no shortage of windows or view in that. Um, the, so what heard, changed? Is it just knowledge, education? I think materials too, and like technology with glazing and, and things like that, right? I, I think that played a part. I also think it's just um, energy modeling and paying attention to the local context, right? Um, really can drive good decisions. Like, should we put a large window here or not, right? Should we orient the house this way or that way? Should we, if we don't have the opportunity to orient the house because we're working in like say a you know residential neighborhood or something like that yeah how can we design the roof so that we can get solar pv on it how can mm -hmm. we find ways to do this and work within that context and i th actually think that goes back to design where the technology that's improved is actually our understanding of design and being able to dovetail that with the knowledge of the construction industry there's a lot of really smart people you two included that know a lot about 
construction that have a lot of really good things to say during design um, that can make a huge impact, right? Like why not use parallel cord trusses for the floor system so that our HVAC contractor can just run these things right through and we don't even have to use a drill, right? Why that, not? And that's, and so this is an interesting topic because this is what I feel is my role in my company and something that I'm trying to continue to, to educate my team on. And it is when we're talking about constraint and thinking more creatively to net a similar or same result. And, yeah. you know, and oftentimes that constraint is budget and time. And usually one of them is more important than the other. Uh, mm -hmm. where, where we just say, hey, we're tabling quality as our number one priority. Time and schedule are two and three. But it's it's what you just said. It's like, why not use, you know, this kind of trust for for the HAC? It's that level of thinking that I find challenging to encourage or or get my team to always, you know, be in that mindset. Where it's mm -hmm. like, all right, you know, we, we, we have, and, and, and I say that with the, the understanding that for me, I continue to realize that I'm not always giving all of the information, you know, classic example was many years ago. I, we, we were tasked to do this carpentry job. I had two of my carpenters go there. They're working on it. I didn't tell them how long we had budgeted for, nor the money that was that, that we had to do the job. And when. I had budgeted two weeks and I just told them to get it done and do it to the best of their ability. And it took them six weeks. And, you know, and I'm like, man, we lost a ton of money. And they're like, well, why? I'm like, well, I only budgeted two weeks. It's like, dude, if you told us it was two weeks, we would have done this differently. And we would have yeah. focused on something like, so, you know, I, I, I do recognize that I have to be better about always sharing all of the information, but it's even when, you know, the information is shared, it's like, Hey, we got 18 months to build this house. It's like, nah, it's, it's really a 24 month project. It's like, why is that the, the, you know, response where it's like, okay, well, the only way we can do it in 18 months is if we have X, Y, Z. And well, I think it becomes a, I think it actually becomes a, a leadership thing, right? Where you totally. can let the um, carpenters who have really good ideas about what, you know, those carpenters just told you like, oh, if I had only known, we could have done right. it differently, right? Totally. But if you could do that earlier on in the process, right? Like maybe during schematic design and say, well, why are we using X in this particular scenario? I know as a carpenter that if that, that fastening system is really expensive or time consuming, why don't we just switch it to Y and then we can skip that whole thing altogether. I just saved you a bunch of money. It goes a lot quicker. We're, we're, we're skipping over that ability to uh, empower these smart carpenters that know their stuff to give input into the design, which then can save money, improve performance, and also potentially be quicker also. Right. And so, you know, we went with design build, but it doesn't mean it can't work in other scenarios. Right. I would say if mm -hmm. the client has an architect they want to work with, choose the builder at the same time, mm -hmm. get everyone in the room at the same time, including the carpenters that work for that builder and have them stare at that schematic design before it goes through engineering and design development to get their input because they're going to be the ones that are going to be installing this and they're the ones that know what takes time, where to save money and all that stuff. The architect doesn't know that. The GC might not have the bandwidth to know every little detail of every project, but the carpenters do. Do you right? know like I feel like there would have to be such massive changes within our industry in the way that people approach hiring a contractor and the way that contractors are so used to working to be like, mm -hmm. you know what, let's bring our carpenters in at design stage. Like all of us would love that, but that's so far from what our industry does that it's almost retraining everyone that like, hey, this is the best option to get the best product the most efficiently that that we can so uh the word architect mm -hmm. uh in latin means master builder and it used to be that that architect had to go through and become a master builder before they could do designs right, right? and that's how buildings were delivered now around the uh second world war we needed to really start putting out a lot of uh you know uh buildings right after the world war right and so 
we separated the architect from the builder because the architect could make all these designs and the builder could do it. It made for really fast production. But what we lost in there was that knowledge, right? And the ability to have those iterative conversations between the master builder and the architect, right? And so we lost the ability to make cost-effective decisions when it comes to comfort, durability, resilience, whatever it is, right? And so we've diverged for about 50, 75 years now. And simply what I'm saying is like, we need to bring that back together, but maybe not in the head of one old bearded white dude, but instead like an organization that does all those, right? So it's not one guy's brain, it's an organization's brain, right? And Tyler, you're totally right. Like, I mean, it's a big change from what um, we're used to, what we're used to doing now currently, right? And I'm not going to say it's easy, but I can't say that I've made that change, right? Within my company yeah. and paid dividends, right? Was it easy? No, it took years. It took a lot of hard work, but I'm here now and it's just building. It's just designing. It's, it's, it's really, yeah, there was a transition. Anytime you're learning something new, it's going to take you time and money, mm. right? And yeah, it's like turning the Titanic around, but we also need to deliver I mean, this is the modern craftsman. We're talking about craftsmen here, right? Like this is, let's talk about craftsmanship in the performance of our buildings, the comfort of our buildings, the assemblies in our buildings and stuff like that. Like, where does that come from? That comes from the people that are doing it, yeah. right? And so we need to bring this in. I'm not saying it's easy and we can just go like this, but I want to bring that conversation out there and things are not getting cheaper, right? And we do need to start making buildings that use less energy because we're facing a climate crisis, right? This month was just the hottest July in record ever, right? Um, we can, the a building we're using right now uses the equivalent of uh, 2.4 hair dryers to heat the house on the coldest hour of the coldest day of the year. Wow. Um, and it's offset with a solar array and they have batteries that also take the excess battery and energy and put it into their electric cars, right? Like the technology's there, we can do this, we can optimize how we're delivering buildings. I think the way that our industry is delivering buildings is broken. And it started when we broke the builder from the designer. Yeah, that and I, I, I think that that's, that's huge. I mean, you think about the way that houses used to be designed and built and there there's, that's under one umbrella, even for the sake of just like if somebody's going to design and to build a house and they're hands on, they're not designing four or five houses at a time. Like they're designing the house that they're going to build next. And they're sorting through all those details prior to building that house. And yeah, technology was different and home design was different, but the, the, the handling that you have on a project where you are designing one project, building one project, through completion in house is a completely different experience than an architect who's designing six projects at once, who's handing it over to a builder who's doing eight projects at once. It, it there's, yeah. it's completely different. It absolutely is right. Um, and um, our our business and the way both. that our industry is shaped. Oh, is that me, Nick? You got me now. No, I'm back. Oh, oh. hey. Um, we lo Sorry. I think we lost you for a second. Um, so like that, that the way that our business has shaped and oriented itself over the years of, of completing and partaking in multiple projects at one time in order to be able to make money, um, has bred a lot of the issues and, and the separation between designer and builder has bred a lot of issues that we're facing today. I mean, none of this has happened overnight. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I feel as though everything that the general industry has been doing has not been anything that has been helping or remediating or assuaging this this situation in any way. It becomes a race to the bottom based on dollars to try to meet what seems like a higher standard that should be more expensive when it's like the conversation's wrong here, guys. It's not you know, we need to think about the way we deliver these buildings in order to provide this, right? And I think a, a big component of that, and Nick, this is something I wanted to talk to you about, like, you and I were in Switzerland about this time last year. And um, we were there as part of the SEGA uh, construction yep. tour. And um, we went to see a, uh, a school 
uh, it was a trade school um, where we got the tour, you know, all these like high school kids uh, that were learning uh, carpentry and the craft and all this kind of stuff. And those kids came out of that school uh, being paid a minimum of $60,000 a year per the Canton's rules. That was the, the Swiss state. But they usually, it turns out they got paid more than that, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, and they were also very highly respected within society, right? Mm -hmm. And their buildings there are really well done. Mm -hmm. And that really stuck with me. And, and how that relates to this conversation is, is that here in North America, we don't, or at least in the US, uh, we don't train our builders. There's no education there, right? right. There might be a one-off course here or there or something like that. Um, but, you know, to see what they were doing in Switzerland and then look at the quality of buildings that they were producing, there's a connection there, right? Um, th it's a cultural issue. They um, totally. respect the trades and put the money into training them and doing that and they get better things for it. Whereas like that's broken here now too, right? I think if we were to change the way we deliver buildings and integrate the design and build a little more and educate uh, the uh, trades people, I think everyone would come out ahead here, right? I mean, you think about the three things you need to build a building. You need an architect, an engineer, and a, and a builder. The architect is in school for four years undergraduate, four years graduate program, then they work for two years of an inter internship before they can design their first like garbage disposal area, right? The uh, contractor here in Oregon could take a one hour open book test and right. they're a contractor. The engineer takes a, a four year program. It's like, right. why can we lay off these architects and let's bring it up on the builders and let's meet in the middle like the engineers do. And I think we would all benefit greatly from that. And I that's a hard problem to solve. I think one thing that I noticed, or at least I, I think I noticed in Switzerland versus the US is that there's just way more of a demand here. And it's almost an unnecessary demand where there, there was it seemed way more supportive to the multifamily, you know, buildings where, mm. you know, we are seeing a shift where there's a lot more multifamily in, you know, the U.S. And we're seeing that these projects are becoming more and more relevant. But single family housing seems to be way more popular here. And there's a huge demand for it. And when you say, hey, let's make these, you know, passive certified or FIA certified or really high energy efficient, it's like, yeah, we don't have the time for that. We, we're going to build into the code and we're because we got to get this shit up and, and delivered because we're running out of housing. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, so it's it's this whole where Switzerland, I mean, just the, you know, um the quality of life is, is different. It's, it, it's, well, it's, it's a, much it's a, it's a more, mind shift, right? Yeah, It's like, way more, everything is so much more intentional there. It's just, it's very, everything seems incredibly thought, thought out. And, you know, it, you go it's to a multifamily building and there's like, they have an area for like the kids, like daycare and they have like an area for bikes and they have like access to like, right. I mean, that is way better than some, yeah, and you're starting to see it here in some in some way, but it's it. There's just way too much pressure to to slow down and do it right. Where it's like, you know, until code requires it, it's it, it'll continue to be hard. And and even when co code does require it, you're still gonna have the guys that are flying under the radar. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's not going to be an easy transition. And our industry is going to change a lot in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. Like, look, look at Massachusetts, right? Like any yeah. building over 12,000 square feet has to be passive house certified as code minimum. Mm -hmm. And we all know that everything comes from uh, commercial into residential, right? That is in the next code cycle change or two for everybody. And that's within the next three to six years. And it's going to be, it's going to be ugly. As people How is twelve thousand square feet the the starting number for that though? Like, I feel like it should be way less than that. Well, I think the reason why I don't know, but it's a lot easier to hit, um, like, a, say, a FIAS target uh, in a multifamily building uh, when it's larger because you have more internal gains and you have less exterior walls. Because you think about all those units, they yeah. only sh they share three of the walls and one is exterior, right? 
So they have less losses on the three walls. So the more you stack together, the easier it becomes to meet an efficiency target. So if I had to venture a guess, it's because it's the trades associations were okay with that because it's not that different from yeah. regular building. Uh, it's just a little more attention to air tightness and a little more attention to your window placements and up. I feel windows. like to make a change to implement that to capture the residential market where people are just building these monstrosities of houses. Mm. Like if you were to lower that and capture that residential market, if the people have the money to be building homes that big, why not make them spend the money on on creating an energy efficient home? Um, would make more sense to me. Obviously, that I don't know. It seems like lowest hanging fruit to to be. I guess it's a start, but to aim it at a building style um, or size or use that's already fairly easy to capture. That it's like let's go after something else as well. Well, I think that also makes it so that, you know, you don't want to apply a regulation that will really affect the lower levels of the income bracket. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you were to say, uh, do require something of bigger buildings, that's probably not going to be the bottom half of the income bracket that's building 5,000 square foot buildings, right? It's going to be the people that can afford it. And it's like, well, okay, if you're going to do that, maybe you do have to make it and maybe that's how it could start. You know I mean? I yeah. think it's interesting conversation because we do want to pay attention to making sure that we don't make things unaffordable for those that can't afford this. Right. Sure. But I mean, if you're building like a 10,000 square foot house, it's like you're able to afford three, four, five of a normal person's house, like make it energy efficient. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't build a 10,000. Maybe it's going to shun people away from building a 10,000 square foot house. Which would be a good thing. I know. Like why, why, unless, unless you're the Brady Bunch, I don't think that you need a 10,000 square foot house. And still, I don't think you do. Yeah. The Brady Bunch probably had like a three bedroom, you know, tiny yeah. little house. I don't know if I, they ever showed the house in the Brady Bunch. I don't remember. I it definitely it wasn't 10,000 square feet. No. no. <clears throat> I'm going to look Absolutely it up. Not. Yeah. Um, the house, yeah. <laughs> we we don't have too much time, but something I wanted to was, uh, dude, that was a fifty one hundred square foot house. Was it really? Yeah, you're able to find that out that quickly. <laughs> yeah, the um, Brady Brunch, fifty one hundred square foot house. Something that is a big that, house. They were they were well off, right? I mean, the Brady Bunch, they were pretty well off. Yeah, sold, I feel like even recent, the house value sold for five and a half million. Yep. Wow. Where was uh, it? Somewhere in like LA, LA or something? LA, yeah. yeah. Um, 11222 Dilling Street, Los Angeles. Oh, there's the... <laughs> now everything. Uh, That's fine. Um, so something Sorry, I wanted to talk to you about, because I, I feel it's a conversation um, that we have with Nick all the time. Um, you took your business, you grew your business. Uh, I think you said you had up to like 24 employees and you're back down to what, 13, 14 now. Um, and you said there were a few reasons why you wanted to scale back, but a lot of them ended up being um, employees not being happy, you not being happy, customers not being happy, and just losing that that sense of feel um of what you were doing and ha and not having the touch on everything that was coming out of your business um it just seemed as though things were slightly unmanageable um something that i heard you say was that you placed a lot of value on the opportunities that you would be able to create and provide for your employees and your teams and how important this is to you right to whatever wants to grow a business and you want to scale up and do more work. And at the end of the day, you did that. And then you chose to scale back and how much more fulfilling it is to be at the point and the place that you are right now. I just want to dig into that a little bit because I, I feel as though that's something that Nick is oftentimes struggling with um, and trying to make sense of and what that experience has been like for you. Yeah, well, let me start by saying it wasn't like it was all perfectly strategic and I had planned that. Like there was some bumps in the road. There were some things that happened that kind of caused us to kind of lose track of things. You know, like for instance, this uh, development behind me here, large development of 11 homes. I, I took that on while running my business at the same time. 
And it was a time when we were like, grow, 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 because I thought that's what we we're supposed to do. You know, I was just say yes to projects that would come, right? And we weren't being strategic about it. And I, I got over my skis, right? And I almost lost the business at that point in time. We had employees leave and it got pretty ugly for a minute there. But through that process, I learned what was really important. Um, and I don't know that I would have gotten where I am without having gone through that process um, to understand that, you know, we spent a bunch of years uh, after that doing what we called growth through values, not growth through numbers or projects or size of projects or whatever. And what I meant by that was like, let's be, let's be picky about the projects we do take and let's try to do the best we can for, you know, the comfort, health, durability, resilience of the house, but let's also do the best we can for our staff so that they feel empowered. They have the ability to make decisions for themselves. They can be adults and provide them with really good benefits and time off and, and all that kind of stuff and education about building. And so that, you know, again, it's that leadership thing about empowering people to make those decisions and then listening to them and incorporating their ideas into the actual buildings that we're doing. To me, that's growth because we are creating a better situation for the staff. We are creating better buildings. Our clients were happier. And if that's not growth, what, you know, when we were getting bigger and bigger, I was making more money, but I was also like, we had middle management and it was just like, I was not happy, right? Like now we're making the same amount of money, but I feel like I have a lot more time. I, I, I do a lot of extra work besides just running bird's mouth at this point in time. Um, and I have more time to be with my family. I have more time to join you guys and talk about what we need to do to make our buildings better mm -hmm. and support the mission of our company. You know, like again, trying to address climate change through the built environment by having more time, by taking less projects and doing better at them and not growing, it's allowed me to spread my mission way further than I ever could have taste chasing my tail around being so busy, just trying to grow and say yes to everything. So, um, so my quality of life has gotten way better since I've made that change. How is the, how is that the, well, I guess the cumulative, uh, the, the sum of those decisions, how has that affected your employees overall morale, health, and your relationship with them? Like what are the differences between having 24 people and your touch points on jobs and how you were involved and now having half that amount of employees, like how has that um, bettered the relationship between your employees and the overall business experience that you guys possess at this point? Well, you know, it was like the headless hydra or whatever, right? So, I mean, it was like me just saying, hey, go do this. You're the project manager on this project, figure it out, get it done. You know, I'm not going to get you the resources that you need or take the time that I need to get this done. They'd be on their own hanging out there without a clear direction of what they were supposed to do or the resources they need to do that successfully. And maybe they were wearing too many hats, right? Like I was telling them to project manage and site manage and do some carpentry all at the same time. And now we've kind of given everyone their different roles and I've empowered them that they have a clear direction about what's expected of them. Um, they have the resources they need, like, oh, you guys need some more scaffolding uh, because there's not enough. Well, let's get that to you so that you can be successful in what you need to do, right? Oh, do you need, uh, you know, maybe we've got to explore a different software system in order to get your project management and communication to the place that you want it to be. Let's do that, right? Um, so they feel um, more like they can be themselves. And I can look at them and say, well, what are you, everyone's got strong suits and weak points or whatever, but I can uh, help them with, I have the time to help them with their weak points and then encourage all the good things that they're doing. Right. And so people like that, any adult wants to know what they're supposed to do and have the resources to do it, to excel, and then not have someone breathing down their neck, telling them what to do all the time and expecting them to do way more than they could possibly do. And so that's the difference. Right. And like now they feel empowered. They feel like they, have a clear sense of what's expected of them, right? Mm. I'm kind of repeating myself, but that, so that it's, it's means less a lot to a person. Of, it's less of you setting them loose and saying, this is your responsibility, take care of this. Not necessarily this is on you, but I'm giving you the free, because I, I feel as though so many people confuse in empowerment 
um for like abandonment right where it's like well yeah, i'm right. i'm i'm giving you all the leash that you need to be successful where like they still they still want to be on a leash to mm-hmm. some point you know they they want to be able to go out well, some but they still want to know that you're there if they need you sure i mean it's like if you tell someone go do baseball and they're like okay i'm gonna do baseball yeah versus telling them like okay you're gonna be the catcher and i need you to pay attention to learn these signals and what you know whatever it is it's like you're giving them a direction that is achievable and an expectation of something versus like go do baseball where it's like well am i supposed to be delivering beer in the stands or am i supposed to be like what am i doing here you know yeah um so I think you need to have that component up too. You can't just get, tell people what to do and then delegate it and walk away. You have to like give them clear expectations and then you have to check in, right? You have to, you know, we do annual reviews. We, they set goals every year. We check in at various times throughout the year and, and check in with that, them about that. Um, and it, it works because people like want to know what they're supposed to do. People want to please, people want to be able to excel. But if they yeah. don't know what it is that they're supposed to be excelling at, how could they possibly excel? Right. So that's kind of what I said before. Like, you know, when I was like, here's this project, just do it because I don't have time. That's yeah. not delegation. I mean, in some ways it's delegation because you're literally just giving it to them, but that's not a successful way to go about it. Yeah. It, it's, it's definitely a delicate balance. And I, I don't know if there's a, a single solitary answer. Um, and I think obviously every situation is different, but it, it's trying to figure out what works, what scale that you are as a builder, a remodeler, and who you have working for you. Um, and I, I think obviously you're trying to paint with broad brush strokes so that the the overall system works for a lot of people. And then you have to fine tune and hone that per each employee. Um but I would imagine that it's a pretty delicate line between giving too much and not giving enough uh, and finding out where that works for everybody. Um, And I'm sure that we have systems in place with that. We, I check in with the operations team on um, Fridays. I check in with the design team on Mondays. I check in with the retrofit team on Wednesdays and Thursday afternoon. I check in with the office and that happens every week. We take notes, we read last week's notes, uh, go through all the projects that they're working on, ask what they need, resources, what challenges they might have, um, help them with those challenges, get them resources. And so I check in once a week. You know, it's my typical week. That's what I do. I got my Monday morning design meeting. I got my Friday morning operations meeting. And so, yeah, you, you absolutely have to like, you can't just, you have to give it attention, Yeah. right? You can't just let it rip. Um, interestingly, uh, you're talking about how we went from larger to smaller and the growth through values things that we've been doing and not growing through projects. But what's happened of late is interesting because we've had employees stay around for so long that every year they're getting raises and they're expecting more and they deserve more. Uh, what's happening is our overhead is becoming bigger yeah. uh, in terms of our sales. And so we're up against this new reality of like, there's two ways out of this. Like either we can grow and sell more so that the percentage of that overhead becomes less of the total sales, right? This is capitalism at work, right? Like either you can grow to keep going or uh, you could look at something like a worker owned cooperative or something like that or employee ownership so that people can start, you know, uh, working towards their retirements and get a share of the company themselves too. Uh, and the latter seems like a more interesting and equitable way to approach it versus just growing. But um, we are looking to grow in people and projects in this next year. And it's the first time in about four years that we've uh, strategically decided to grow and take on more projects because we need to be able to keep our overhead down Mm -hmm. because we're paying our people more because they've been around for a long time, which is what you want, right? So it's just been this little like microcosm of capitalism that's happening all of a sudden. It's like, oh, it's, I guess we do have to grow. We're in a similar spot too with growth and, and, you know, thinking about the people here. And that was a conversation that came up. It's like, you know, eventually they're going to be priced out of their, their role, unless they just get a cost of living increase, you know, they're going to, you know, how do you continue to grow? And so something I've been working on for the 
better part of the last week is what does the career path look for each role? So I've like I've my whiteboard all dressed up and I get notes on every in my my computer. It's like, all right, apprentice. This is how this is your career path. These are the things that you do to become a carpenter, to become a lead carpenter. And one of the questions one of my guys was like, Hey, I'm a lead carpenter. What if I don't want to go into project management and I want to stay a lead carpenter? What is what does that look like? Yeah. And, you know, so I had to sit and, and really think about, well, what does that look like? And what is that, you know, how, if you're a lead and there's not, that, you know, do you become a senior lead? Is that, do you become a master carpenter? What does it mean to be a master carpenter? It's like, or do you, do you have to pay them more? Like you mentioned, because of the cost of living every year. And at some point, does that like cost of that employee become too much that the residential market can bear? There's like a ceiling. And, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and the and, and, like the efficiency is there at some point. Like, all right, so my employees have been with me five years; they've become more efficient, so I'm paying them more, but they're getting more done. But you're going to cap off at some point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The one in 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 my research and doing that specific to the carpentry role, what it came down to is, you know, all right, you you move into like a senior lead, and that senior lead becomes specialized, and it's like, all right, that he's the stair guy. Like he's the one that does stairs and, mm. you know, and obviously that doesn't work in every model, but it, you know, in, in thinking about how someone grows within, you know, a carpenter's role, it's like, all right, well, all right, he becomes the, the stair guy. So when he's doing stairs, he's super efficient at it. And, you know, maybe he's making 70 bucks an hour, but he's doing the staircase in a week instead of two weeks. Yeah. And it's an interesting it's an interesting thought and something that I've bumped up against too. It's like, there's nothing wrong with somebody wanting to be a lead. No, and that's, and, and, be, like, that's brilliant. You, probably, you know, you like, probably, yeah, you probably feel the same way as I is where it's you, you want to continue to give them more money. It's like, I, I, I'd love to, I'd love you to make $200,000 a year, but it's like, I don't know how right. to make that work. Like, so it becomes, you know, what is his role? Like, what is that person's role continue to adapt into and beyond that, it's all right, well, hey, you're a lead carpenter, you're a specialized lead carpenter, you're a senior lead. And being a senior lead, that means um, you also need to be training the leads and the carpenters and the apprentices. Yeah. And, and and now you're able, like, rather than off, rather than paying for training outside, now you have in-house training. And it's like, all right, well, now I can delegate money towards that as well. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how someone continues to grow. Um, it's a it's a very much a work in progress for me right now right now but those are interesting ideas i like that um yeah you know the um yeah it, you want you want to pay people more but the residential construction market just isn't willing to pay any more right. than a there's certain a market amount. whereas like yeah. you get into multifamily commercial there's room for growth just kind of indefinitely because it's more of like a business transaction but when you're mm -hmm. dealing with people's homes and you're dealing with a market that might be artificially deflated like we were talking about it earlier um it really beg puts those really good long-term carpenters in a position where like, what do you do with these people that have been awesome that are here this long? And yeah, I, some of your ideas are really good, Nick, and I appreciate planting that seed, but yeah, I'll share, that we I'll share about, it with you yeah. as we develop, because it, it's, you know, truthfully, it's something that a lot of my team has asked for and I've struggled to, to really communicate that, you know, for a long time. When I started the company, I was like, I'm not going to have, there's no job titles. Everyone's like, what? I'm like, I, the job titles are stupid. Let's just, let's just work. We all know what we've got to do. And the reality is they don't. And, and Tyler said it earlier. It's like, they, they need the leash. It's the classic example of, you know, Google giving you as much vacation time as you want. No one takes it because they don't know what is appropriate. Sure. Where it's like, we hey, all gotta I, serve. yeah, if I tell you, Hey, you got two weeks vacation, you're taking your two weeks. If I tell you, you can take yeah. whatever you want. You might take a week. It's funny. That's true. Um, yeah, you know, we all got to serve somebody, right? It's like for, as the owner of the company, I'm serving our clients, right? And they're keeping right. me on a leash and they're telling me what my constraints are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I suppose if I, it's kind of like that blank piece of paper I was talking about before, I could just design all sorts of things that don't make any sense and really aren't that creative, but you have that leash, if you want to call it that, um, then things start to work, right? I think it's the human condition, right? We, we yeah. need to have uh, direction and clarity and have that outline for us in order to succeed. I mean, no direction is the, the most, uh, the most difficult thing. I think even my kids are like, I'm hungry. 
and I, I asked them, well, what do you want? I don't know anything. Do you right. want this? Do you want that? No, no. Well, give me some sort of direction. Do you want something <laughs> hot, cold, salty, sweet? Like, give me a direction. And then it's far yes. easier than just like, I don't know anything. And then yeah. everything you ramble off, they're like, no, 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 no. And I'll make it yourself then. Um, I love that. Yeah, we do that with restaurants. We're like, where do you want to, where do you want to go? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. Go to the taco place? No. no. I go to the Thai? No. Like, come on, help me out here. Yeah, so <laughs> give me something. Like, what are you in the mood? I don't know. All right, well then, what do you want me to do? Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, like there there has to be. Whereas if you said like, do you want grilled cheese or do you want a tomato sandwich? Like, you know, it's like they'll let you know which one they prefer. Very yeah. easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like no, no, di no direction is worse than too much direction. Yeah. Um, but Which I, is why I think we need things like job titles. Yeah. 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 I mean, we have job titles and we have clear job descriptions, you know, that you can graduate up same, into. And that's, that's helped it, a lot. <laughs> you know, we, we, we're, we have very clear job title description responsibilities, but now it's, well, what's the next? And what are the things mm -hmm. I need to do in order to, to get to the next step? And it's like, I yeah. have, I have probably six or eight positions up on my board that don't even exist. But it's like if it is if we continue to grow, that they would move into that role. And in, I mean, for example, well, like you know, I have assistant project manager, project manager, senior pre PM, and then operations manager, and then director of oper operations. I have a director of operations. I don't have a senior PM nor an operations manager. But as that PM grew, like if they became a senior PM, what does that mean? What's the difference? And what is that? How does that change from a PM? And then what is, what is, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at is like, I'm trying to outline like what, what it means to go from PM to a senior PM and, yeah, what, and how like, does the responsibility change? Because if you're making X amount, 20, 20% more in your salary, well, how am I, how are we offsetting that? You know, are mm -hmm. you, are you 20% more efficient? Are you, overseeing the project managers and and they're 20 percent more it, it's you know it all attributes back to the the cost of construction which is what you were saying yeah and it's tough and it, i think it's one of the you know we all try to have successful businesses that last a long time and have employees that are with us a long time and that's like that's the ideal right but i'm starting and it sounds like you two nick are, are bumping up against this kind of interesting thing where it's like huh what happens when you kind of reach the upper ends of that? Like what becomes of it? And and that's where growth is an answer, right? Like we could take on more work, which might um, necessitate the need for more training, which would necessitate the job title improvement to director of operations or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But without that growth, you know, this is like capitalism, right? And this is where it's interesting with the worker on cooperative model where they can have more buy-in to the um, types of jobs that you're working on or how we set up the company. They're, they're part of the management team and they feel like they have a, a voice in how the business is being run. And if the business is successful, well, then they get more of a return, right? Mm -hmm. And beyond what their wage is, right? So they can put in as much as they want and get the kind of return they want through that model without right. having to necessarily grow, 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 grow. Um, and so, uh, it's just been on, uh, my mind lately. It's, uh, I'd be curious to see where you end up with that. And yeah, I'll share it. Yeah. Um, yeah. cause it's something that I started and I'm, I'm committed to getting it done because it seems, it seems to be on my to-do list forever. And I realized how uh, important it is recently. So, yeah, uh, we, we had, um, we had two podcasts today and I feel like I want to get both guests back on because I yeah. didn't cover everything that I wanted to cover. I don't know about you, Nick, if you feel the same way. No, I do. Absolutely. Um, it was like yeah, a, well. a, a double up day and I'm like, so we had a, a Sarah Schultz on earlier who is a brand designer and then obviously yourself on. I'm like, I feel like I have so much that I still want to talk to both of you about. Um, so we're, I feel like we're going to have to do a follow-up sooner than later. Hit me up. Yeah. I mean, it, it's great. I like having these conversations. I like living in this world of like thinking about our industry and improving it. And, uh, you know, some of the ideas that you had Nick around the growth or this is good stuff. And, um, yeah, I'd be happy important. to. It's important. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, ultimately 
the the whole goal is to to work together and, and improve um and you know to to circle back to what your you guys stand for in and what we talked about in switzerland too it's like you're 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 doing this for the greater good of the climate but all but but just you society know, society yeah. right exactly people yeah 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 which, which is awesome. and, and that's what gives people you know that's another thing we didn't really talk about too is giving people a sense of mission right you know like south mountain company is an interesting one where they do a lot of um volunteering in their community and stuff like that and we what's started it what's it called that. south mountain company south mountain company and martha's vineyard great uh design build company um it's a, worth checking out. Really interesting um, company. The um, what's his name? Uh, John Abrams is the uh, founder of that company, and he's wrote a book about worker on cooperatives too. Um, but the point I was going to make was um, that those employees get a lot of reward out of doing work in their community, and we started doing some of that too, working for a local nonprofit called Taking Ownership, which is trying to keep. Uh, you know, black families from losing their their homes and creating generational wealth by going in and replacing windows or fixing the whatever it is, you know, and we'll donate our time to do that. And almost without exception, when I ask people like, what was the best thing you did this past year? What was the most meaningful? Like, what makes you happy? They're like, it was when we were doing that volunteer work, you know, and we helped mm -hmm. that one woman with her family and like, you know, like, and so that's an interesting way to you know, say, Hey, maybe Mr. Project manager, maybe you could take on this volunteer project next year and you can give back to the community because it means a lot. And if they're thinking about like, well, maybe I didn't get as much money as I wanted and there's another company I could work for, they'll pay me a little bit more, but they're not doing that. And that's really meaningful to me. That might keep people around, you know? And yeah, absolutely. For it, you know? Yeah, and I, th I think that I mean, we've discussed that before as far as service goes. And a lot of times we're so focused on the, the financial reimbursement of our time. Uh, and you lose sight of what's really important and what really gives you a lot of self-worth and gratitude. Um, and I think that service does that. I mean, it's why a lot of it's why we do a lot of what we do. I mean, it, I can speak for myself only, but you know, the, the podcast isn't a lucrative investment of our time when you look at how much goes into it. Um, but it's the, the hopes that it's going to help people, um, and better the industry and, and long-term, um, will make an impact on our peers and those people who are looking to do good by the construction industry. So I think that service work is something that's very important, um, and should be taken seriously. Yeah. And it feels great, right? I'm, I'm sure you get a lot of reward from these conversations and I'm sure you hear stories about someone you influence through the podcast or whatever. And that's all gotta, the time. Yeah. Like be great. You know, I mean, that that's what keeps you ticking. Right. Yeah. I mean, if it weren't for that, honestly, like, why would you do it for, right. for a couple bucks here, a couple bucks there? It doesn't really yeah. make right. that yeah. much sense. Yeah. I think it, it enriches your life more than just that. Um, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you have coming up that you're excited about that you want to get off your chest that you want to touch on before oh, we man, wrap we... before we wrap things up anything like you know that you're you have in your pocket that you just want to unload <laughs> man uh, we could go on and on like, i'll give you a couple little tidbits we're um really interested in these new uh induction ranges that have batteries in them um because you can plug them into a 110 outlet so you don't have to upgrade your panel and if the power goes out, they have enough battery to run your fridge off so that your fridge doesn't spoil. And so they're great because you don't have to like spend $1,200 upgrading your, you know, uh, getting a, a 220 line behind your range, mm. right? And you get a great experience cooking, but if the power goes out, you can still cook and you can use that to power your fridge. So anyways, the idea of like putting batteries and electrifying everything uh, just is an interesting thing. Um, and then uh, we're also doing a, a pretty cool system with a, a Minotaur. Uh, so this is the HVAC uh, plus dehumidification all in one unit that does ventilation, heating, and cooling. But it doesn't have quite enough horsepower for a full-size home. So we're doing a glycol ground loop with a preconditioning heat exchanger prior to the Minotaur with a post-conditioning heat exchanger off of an air-to-water CO2 heat pump to provide additional heating to the houses. 
that's a mouthful. We could talk about that sometime, but working with uh, positive energy, I uh, was just hanging out with those guys at summer camp uh, out in Westford, Massachusetts this last week or so. And uh, they're really into it and we're doing some really cool engineering. And if that system works out, we're going to hopefully do a white paper and kind of let that out into the world. So just doing some really kind of innovative, um, super efficient and cost effective, um, challenging mechanical uh, engineering work at some of the projects that we're doing. So that's cool. anyways, that's a mouthful. We could talk about that some other time, but those are the things that lately I've been kind of thinking about and kind of fun. I'm not going to so, lie. At first I thought you said Minotaur and I was like, isn't that like the half man, half bull? Yeah. But I guess yeah. it's not the same thing. Minotaur. <laughs> if you ever punch it in the internet, it shows you the, the half man, half bull. The Minotaur. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Well, we, uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your day on the West Coast. Uh, it's a little bit earlier in here. It's midday for you, but taking time out of your day to hop on a podcast with us. Yeah, this has been great. And it's, uh, yeah, it's been uh, great to catch up with you too, Nick. Like, I feel like I saw you in Europe and I really haven't seen you since. So Yeah, um, no, I, I'm, I can't believe it's already been a year. Someone said that to me the other day and I was like, damn, you're going to get back over That there. flies. I know. Yeah, exactly. I heard they might be doing a 2024. I heard that. In the, I don't know how real that is. I heard I that no they're going to time it with, I think, that builder show out there. Oh, IBS? No, there's a big, big builder show. Oh, the European one. Yeah, yeah Bauhaus Germany, or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, Bauhaus, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. We'll see. Right. But, all right, man. Well, I appreciate, yeah, like Tyler said, appreciate you being on, and we'll get you back on another episode. Yeah, hit me up. I'm into it. Sounds sweet. sweet man. Thanks, man. Good right, talking. This has been a pleasure. It's been awesome. So enjoy that Take hundred care, and uh, five degrees or whatever it is. Yeah, I'm gonna stay inside and eat a salad tonight. I think. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Take care.